a funding winter. <laughs> it has been a big two days, and I am currently high on Messina ice cream. To talk about this extraordinary thing, we have the incredible Bronwyn Clune, who has been there and done that and now writes about it at Capital Brief. She is one of Australia's most experienced startup journalists, uh, now covering the sector for that media startup, Venture Backed. Joining us once again on the stage is Laura Falconer, the Portfolio Director at X15 Ventures, the venture scaler powered by the Commonwealth Bank. You may have heard from her a little bit earlier talking about their strategy and the amazing companies they're working with. Thrilled to have Lucy Tan, Principal at Square Peg here. Uh, she also wants you to give her money because, what is it, six fund you guys are putting together next? Yep, so, uh, you know, everyone wants money and hopefully the VCs can pick up some tips from this panel as well. And also joining us is Justin Greenstein, the CEO, I was going to say the chief CEO, chief EO of <laughs> 1835i. Justin, great to have you. Braun, over to you. Everyone, tell your incredible stories. Give them a big hand for our last panel of the day. Of course, Australia's other startup journalist of note is Simon Thompson, so good to be introduced by you, Simon. Um, awesome. We are on the final stretch, uh, always the hardest um, slot to fill, but we've got a pretty spicy topic to tackle, and that is this funding winter. So I'll get everyone to just quickly run through uh, and talk about your organisation, and then we'll get into the topic. Um, I'm Laura Faulkner. I'm the Portfolio Director at X15 Ventures. X15 is the venture scaling arm of Commonwealth Bank. And so I look after the, um, the build, buy and invest activity, as well as helping ventures scale with, uh, with ComBank. Hi everyone, I'm Lucy. I'm a principal in the Melbourne office of SquarePeg. We're a venture capital firm that invests across Australia, New Zealand, Israel, and Southeast Asia. And we do it from the very earliest stages of uh, startups. So seed, series A, series B. Hi everyone, I am Justin Greenstein, CEO of 1835i. We are ANZ's, uh, ANZ Bank's innovation and investment partner. Um, what our mission is essentially to do is to partner with startup and scale-up companies who can help ANZ's um, home ecosystem, small, medium business ecosystem, and institutional business. And we invest in anything from seed rounds um, in companies that we incubate through our lab um, through to much more mature rounds um, in fintechs that we invest in, but typically um, series A, B, and C type of rounds of um, fintech top companies. Awesome. So we're going to start off, I think, by um, unpacking the title of our uh, session, which is Navigating a Funding Winter. So I'd love your thoughts on whether we're actually in a funding winter or not. Um, I mentioned our topic to a couple of investors and they said, we've never had so much capital in Australia before. So we'd love your thoughts on that, Sarah, if you want to have a go at that one first. Um, I don't think we necessarily are having an across the board funding winter. Yes, the experience has changed, maybe the seasons have changed a little bit, um, but it really depends on where you're at as a startup um, in terms of um, stage of development, in terms of who your existing investors were, because yes, the dynamics changed, but we had a period where there was a record number of new VC funds coming on board, and they have pressure to deploy capital. They didn't have existing portfolios to, to redirect their capital to. That money was still flowing. Those funds tend to focus at the early stage. So if you were um, starting out, seed funding still flowed through what may be called a funding winter. However, if you're a little bit later, kind of series A stage, it did get a bit harder. The expectation of the proof points that you had, particularly to back up the valuations that were had through um, you know, the peak of the crazy years, um, it got a lot harder. And so you had some fallout from that. So yeah, I think it was felt differently depending on um, the stage of the venture and who was involved. 
Lucy and Justin, do you want to add any thoughts to that? Um, I think it's all relative. Like if you were a startup that was raising in 2020 and 2021, yeah, this will feel like a winter to you because that was very exuberant. I would say almost anomalous times. It's kind of like that chart they show of sort of e-commerce penetration. It's kind of like do, 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 and then 2020, 2021, and then it goes back to a normal line. I would say we're getting back to long-term historical averages. I think that the panel has answered the question quite well. I might just add a little bit of a perspective from an 1835R perspective. Um, and I think that we are pretty nuanced in that we are very much and unashamedly a strategic investor um, in companies that can work with ANZ strategically. So I think from a, from a pure funding perspective, we are probably less sensitive in many ways. We're disciplined in terms of the fact that we want to make sure that um, the companies we're investing in or have invested in have um, good focus on their unit economics, their operational discipline, go to market strategies, so on and so forth. Um, what we did do is we deployed quite a lot of capital in 2020, 2021, like a lot of other companies. And to a large extent, that is um, partly just because there was quite a lot happening. There were you know, a lot of companies either, either coming through or raising capital, and they made strategic sense to us. What, what's happened over the past couple of years is we've really doubled down in terms of supporting those companies. And what we found is the landscape changed. Um, and what I mean by that is investors were really commanding a lot more discipline in terms of what those companies were doing and how they were utilizing the capital that had been deployed. Um, and we want to be there for the long, the, the long run. We're there to strategically work with these companies. And part of that comes with a responsibility of supporting them financially and, of course, operationally and all of those things. So we, we absolutely have spent a couple of years double downing on supporting those companies and specifically in, in a world where they have, um, to some extent, pivoted the way they are growing their businesses and getting scale and um, you know, expanding, whether it's locally or internationally. And also helping a number of the companies that in you know, some respects spent a lot of their capital in 2020 and 2021. And they needed to, to move to a world where they had to show a lot more discipline in, in order to build out their product market fit, so on and so forth. Um, so, so we've very much been focused on supporting them. We haven't thought of ourselves as necessarily being in the winter. We just strategically decided that we wanted to double down and support those companies, both as individual companies, but also enhance their relationships with ANZ Bank. Um, but what we're starting to see now is a number of new companies start to come out um, and look for capital, and we are absolutely active and seeing other investors being active in those spaces as well. But I think it's fair to say that we, you know, we're all showing a lot more um, uh, consideration around discipline, making sure that valuations make sense, assumptions make sense, um, business models make sense, so on and so forth. So there's some blossoms on this uh, cold winter tree. Um, let's talk a little bit about how you're assessing companies at the moment for investment. Because we, you know, the, the environment is different. We're all talking about capital efficiency over growth at all cost. Um, the conversations, I think, have always played out in the Australian context. But now you're seeing overseas, more and more VCs are, are favouring that capital efficiency over that. What kind of metrics are you looking for right now in the companies you're interested um, in investing in? Have, has that changed? What are they? Um, for us, it's, it's the same. It's We invest and partner for strategic rationale. And so it doesn't mean that we have to see the absolute breakout unicorn potential in every single opportunity that we want to work with. If it's solving a big enough problem for us or our customers, um, that's enough for us. So fundamentally, we have to have that first. Everything else is second. Uh, because we're investing so early, sometimes, you know, at seed stage, there are no metrics to look at. So <laughs> it's hard to say that uh, our bar for those metrics have changed because it's pre-product, sometimes pre-revenue. -pre um, I would say that we are being more discerning when it comes to certain types of businesses. Like at the moment, I mentioned this in the panel the other day, but we're seeing AI businesses kind of grow at a clip that I've never seen before. It's sort of like 
zero to 10 million in revenue in six months or some crazy shit like that. And you're just like, how durable is this revenue? What is the quality of this revenue? These are questions that like we really have to stare into these days that you know I wouldn't say was something that we were really uh, perplexed by before this AI shift. Um, for fintech specifically, I think as we're looking at some of the Series A, Series B type businesses, you have to be cognizant of where the market is at and certain corporate budgets have definitely tightened and so certain metrics like expansion revenue rate and year-on-year -year growth rate, we have seen that come down and, and you have to kind of give founders like a, a fair benchmark. Um, it's not going to be like the heyday of like 130% net dollar retention. That's just not where their corporate customers are going to be. Um, so we take a contextual lens to the metrics. Like um, Laura at X15, we are strategic investors. So um, that certainly provides a lot of nuance around how we think of the evaluation criteria of the portfolio companies that we invest in. I think if you um, go back and you know look at 1835, uh, five years, six years ago when we're still very new, we we often invested like a very traditional um, VC slash CVC, and we were very focused on certain metrics. Um, but what we were actually doing is we were finding these investments which we thought were good investments or great investments, and then we we're going into the bank and we we're saying we found a great investment, you now need to partner with them. And what we found is a number of people in the business units were saying, well, you know, how do we align that investment to our strategy? Um, hard to deploy so, sort of business unit funding to bring that in because it's not, not high on the, fun, on the strategy model. And on top of that, what, what also happened is we often had very early stage companies which didn't have the maturity to work with a big bank because as a number of you will appreciate when you're building that partnership and intersection, um, Portfolio companies need to have a good understanding and appreciation for things like regulatory compliance. So we, we had to really work with some of those earlier stage companies to build up that um, operational type of muscle and ensure that they were set up for success to work with a bank. And on the opposite end of the scale, often when we're investing in the super mature companies, they already had global domination in some respect. And um, they'd sort of look at the partnership opportunity and go, well, are we robbing Peter to pay Paul in some respects? What we very much pivoted to now is a, what I'd call a partner to invest model, where we have to validate upfront that there's a good strategic thesis. And we believe that the, the partnership between ANZ and the portfolio company is going to deliver a win-win outcome. And and we'll only invest in companies when we've got deep conviction that the business is committed to the partnership and there's a really good business case to drive that partnership. But likewise, we need to have um, deep conviction in the, in the founder's ability to scale their business, deliver their global aspirations, and um, achieve some of their metrics through the relationship with the bank. And in doing that, we, you know, we, we start to drill down and think about a lot of the typical metrics that you'd think about as a VC. We want to make sure that, A, there's a really good understanding of your key unit economics. We want to make sure that um, the business deeply understands what drives their customer lifetime value and um, what levers they're constantly pulling to increase that. And likewise, um, have a deep understanding of their cost metrics and um, conviction that, you know, you get good economies of scale between your CLTV and your, your CAC as you grow and expand and embed the partnerships with us. So we, we, we really exert a lot of discipline, A, on that partnership side, but also making sure that the company has got um, the maturity and um, the empathy to, to work with a big organization like ours to get that win-win that outcome. Awesome. We, we are open to taking questions from the floor as well, so please raise your hand if you're wanting to ask anything. Um, I, I guess one of the challenges for a lot of companies right now are those ones who raised during the ZERP era, and they now returning to market um, and often are in a position where they're going to have to do a down round. Is that, is that still a dirty word? You know, where are we? Um, what's your advice for companies who are in that position? 
um, you know, navigating this tougher environment than where they raised at. Their valuations, they might not have grown into the valuations that were set for them. What's the best advice you could give for them um, in, in coming back to VCs? I'll hand to you to, to kick that off as the VC on the panel and, and then follow on. Yeah, sure. Um, look, I think that the only thing that kills your business in the early stages is when you run out of money. And so if the choice is between running out of money and having your business die or take a down round, I think most founders would choose the latter. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely think that our founders are thinking about it in very sensible, uh, sensible ways. Um, I would say that uh, I, was, I forgot what, where, where my train of thought was going, but I would say that like it's not, um, it can impact employee morale if you take a down round, so I understand why founders really hesitate to do that. Um, but it's one of those things where I actually increasingly think that VCs don't look at it as a, as a negative anymore. We kind of just see it as, hey, this is the reality of the market. Um, and probably employees also understand if you have to make that difficult decision. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of the reality of today. I think, um, you know, this, this topic all comes down to being practical. And we've, you know, we, we sort of see two types of founders. One who comes to us who we haven't invested before, and then obviously founders in our portfolio company. And I think um, there's definitely a, a group of people who are pragmatic and, and sensible, and then there's probably a group of people who are still living in 2021 to some extent. And by the way, I think that um, the founders in our portfolio are super practical and we, we actually have really good conversations with them. But it becomes, a, it becomes a really interesting conversation with founders that are raising um, money for a whole lot of reasons. First of all, what, you know, what we always do is we go back to the targets and metrics that were set at the last round of funding. And, and what you often find um, in the companies that are probably going to be experiencing down rounds is they haven't achieved targets for a whole lot of reasons. And um, there's a lot of work that I think we do with them to unpack what those reasons are and actually get really, really realistic on what the future forecasts look like and what that means from a valuation perspective. But on the flip, the flip side, you also have to be um, quite practical on what a down round does to dilution because we, we certainly don't want to be in a world where the, the founders... Um, are diluted so much that they're no longer motivated to drive their vision because ultimately we, you know, we, we're investing in them and their vision and their ability to, de to deliver it. So you really have to be very, very balanced and, and practical at that table when you're having these conversations and unpack what the forecasts you know, were, why they haven't been achieved in some cases, where the company's going and how realistic they are in terms of being able to achieve those. So it's a very different type of conversation, I think, to the conversation we're having three or four years ago. Awesome. Just checking with the room if we've got any questions. I have a question. It's okay. Uh, thank you, Justin. Uh, you were saying about the business model that doesn't make sense, and that's what you guys invest in. I don't know if you could elaborate more, for example, about the business which has you know, customers, the money flying from around the world, I'll just repeat the question just so everyone can make sure everyone hears it. The question is about how do you define a business model that doesn't make sense? Yeah. So, so what we look at is, you know, and, and I'm talking in, many, in, in every case here around companies that have broadly found product market fit in their core business and have um, achieved a good, a good number of customers. What we see when I talk about business models is growth and expansion strategies, which have often got very, very, very optimistic assumptions behind them. So, so what you see is you see a company doing X and they want to expand into some sort of adjacency. And against that adjacency, they'll have some you know, amazingly looking forecasts. But when you, 
when you dig beneath the surface and you understand how much work they've done to assess, and I'm going to get a little bit generic here, but you know, the desirability of that additional adjacency or um, the technical feasibility of building it, often it's very, very, very early on. And when you unpack the work that has to be done and the assumptions, you have to get to a level of going, is this realistic or not in the timeframes that you're predicting? If I can just jump into that as well, one of the other things that I often see is you know, the not just over ambition in the like m targets that are set and the assumptions that underpin the model, but also like, you know, we're going to enter you know, X that is greater than one <laughs> new jurisdictions in the next you know, one to two years without actually understanding um, the, the nuances of entering that new market, any additional um, regulatory requirements that might increase the obligations throughout the organization, not just for the customers in that space because of data and how that's handled. Um, so really, like when, when we see an unrealistic business model, it could come from any number of different areas in the business that isn't just um, you know core product, but like can you actually operationalize that safely? Oh, sorry. I was going to add to it because I actually have a slightly different perspective on the business model question. So for me, it's like there's something core about the way that you make money that just doesn't make sense and isn't going to be sustainable in the long term. So the two examples I think of is, one, it's when the cost of acquiring a customer is so high and like way higher than the revenue that you expect to make out of that customer in the short term and in the long term. So just something about that LTV to CAC just doesn't really make sense. Um, and for lending businesses, you know, I mentioned this example from yesterday, but it's like you lend out a dollar, very easy to do, but can you actually get a dollar and more back? Like most businesses sometimes lose a ton of money that way. Um, so I think it's in the unit economics um, of, of a business model, whether it makes sense or not. The other one, sorry, is are you dealing with a business that has a massively leaky bucket? So like, yes, you can acquire them and yes, you can make some money out of them, but only for a short period of time. Like they churn like crazy. And so you're constantly trying to fill this leaky bucket. You're never gonna really build a sustainably large business. Awesome, there's another question at the front. So it's come up from a few founders and in the panel previously that it's not always the problem for founders to raise money, but that in Australia, they can't raise enough money. And so they're sort of, they've got to put money against legal ob uh, ob obligations or compliance, but they can't really get enough money to really scale the business. And I'm interested in your perspectives from an investor side that are there just caps because Australia is a small market and that's why maybe you have to go global. But what's your view on the kind of view of founders saying well, it's hard to get enough money uh, from investment side? Do you have a perspective on that? Well, I think that that's where like strategic partnerships can help. It doesn't all have to come through capital. It can come through distribution channel access that reduces the requirement to have capital to reach those customers. Um, but, it, I, you know, Cut Through Ventures report just came out and there were six mega rounds uh, in the last half year. So um, I think that there, there is a significant amount of capital available in Australia. Not all companies can access it. Um, I do think that the ability to access US markets from an Australian base has shifted. Um, it's not as accessible right now. Maybe that'll change again. Um, but I would just encourage um, you know, founders to think about alternative pathways that isn't necessarily you know, dilutive uh, rounds in order to scale their business. I agree with you. I actually think that sometimes when I get pitch decks um, and I see someone trying to raise a pre-seed or a seed and it's like, we're gonna raise 500K, I'm like, yo. <laughs> that is not enough money to get you sufficient milestones to your next round. Because once you enter sort of that VC hamster wheel, it is a hamster wheel. Like you're gonna be trying to get to the next round and the round after that and the round after that. And each round comes with its own set of expectations of what you should be achieving by that stage. And if you raise 500K, like what are you gonna build? Who are you gonna hire, right? So I get anxiety when I see rounds like that. And so oftentimes, 
what I try to figure out from that founder is what is your ambition? Like, what is the type of business that you want to build? Because not everyone wants to build a VC style business. Maybe you just want a highly profitable cash cow, in which case, maybe 500K is enough to get you started and to get the ball rolling. But if you're going for a VC style business, oftentimes I think a healthy seed round is probably more around that two to five million dollar mark. Yeah, I think, I think you're, you're, you're both right. And you know, at the end of the day, when, when I put our hat on, we are we're investing in financial services propositions, which require a lot of capital, right? So we, um, we sort of in the in the process of investing in an in an early stage, very early stage company. And one of the things we are looking at is how much capital is this thing going to need to actually scale and deliver against its ambition. And to Lucy's point, you sort of look at it in the early days and you go, is $500,000 or a million dollars realistic? Um, and it's not. So, so one of the, you know, we have sort of two conversations. One is with the founding team around setting those expectations and being really, really clear on what this needs to deliver that vision. But we also have that conversation with our investment committee because we want to make sure that the investment committee is in this for the long run, in the long run if it's something they want to do. We are there to support founders um, throughout their journey, and we want to make sure that, that everyone actually understands what scaling these businesses, which are often you know, enterprise um, software services, actually require from a capital perspective. So ask for more, for more money, folks, I think is the... <laughs> The takeaway there. Um, are there any questions? We're, we're in the last few minutes. Um, Imogen at the front here. Thank you. Hi. Um, for those who have navigated this funding winter really beautifully from your portfolio, what are some consistencies that you're seeing across those companies or across those founders that have made their lives much easier relative to those who have not done as well? Great question. What have people done right? Um, what I've seen in, in our portfolio and other companies that navigated it well was um, taking what was um, sometimes quite painful decisions um, before you had to, um, being very conservative in thinking about the, the risk of running out of money because fundamentally that is the most likely thing to kill an early stage business um, and making sure that they could reset to get to the metrics that they needed to get to. Maybe it was going to take them a little bit longer, um, but anything that they could do to extend their runway. Um, and you know, sometimes that meant really difficult decisions that did slow down the growth of their business, but they survived. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's businesses that, I think, let's say they raised like a really, really big round in 2020 or 2021. Sometimes it might have led to ex excesses in hiring or just excesses in exploring a bunch of different products or wedges and then realizing, hey, the market has changed um, and there's just no way to sustain like so many different product lines or so many different employees within each of these products and really placing a premium on focus, which is actually a startup's biggest advantage. It's that you are laser focused on a wedge that you're going after. And so I've seen our best companies really just take stock of, hey, this is the amount of capital I've got. This is, these are where my product is seeing real green shoots of growth. I'm just gonna go hard at that thing um, and then forget the noise, forget the rest. Um, I will just carry on on one theme that I've raised, and that is pragmatism and balance. And the founding teams that we have seen be really, really pragmatic and balanced in terms of how they've shifted from a 2021 world to a 2024 world um, is where people have been set apart. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, coming out at the end of 2021, an obvious thing to do was say, hey, we're going to take cost out of the business and we're going to, um, you know, we're going to put cost discipline in. And, 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 and the challenge with that is, if you take too much cost out, you've strangled this business which you know, has to be a high growth business with deep global conviction. And the truth is, if you, if you take all your costs out and you strangle the business, you can't do that. So that's not a good thing. But likewise, um, spending unnecessarily is not a good thing. And what we saw is the, 
the, the companies had really deeply, deeply, deeply understood where their costs were and what levers they could pull responsibly and in a balanced way have really been the ones that have come out on the other end in a very, very strong manner. And the one um, portfolio company of ours that really stands out is one that you know, had global ambitions and the ambition to, to expand overseas. And moving out of the 2021 world, they did it. They, they went into the US, but they went into the US in a very, very, very thoughtful and balanced way. Um, and have found incredible product market fit um, in a specific area, which is, which is actually to some extent pivoted their business in a, in a magnificent way. And they, they did it in a way where enormous amounts of capital were not being spent. They weren't coming and raising you know, huge amounts of capital from their investors. And it was really, really interesting to see how their, how their metrics shifted in a super positive way um, through, that, through that pivot, both from a revenue perspective and a cost perspective. So, so seeing those um, you know, pragmatic, balanced founders that deeply understand the levers in their businesses um, is in my mind what, what really sets them apart. And some of the cost out can be like wildly easy. One of our companies just rang every single one of their suppliers and renegotiated the contracts and got a huge amount of cost out of their business. Um, so it doesn't have to be uh, you know, dramatic changes to the business to make a real difference to run right. Awesome. We are flat out of time. I know we could keep going, but it looks like we're about to be joined by a conga line. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and thanks for hanging in there for the final talk. Thanks, everyone. Thank you to Justin.